Assalamualaikum, selamat pagi, good morning. Okay, continuing with the course. This is practical number four. We are still looking at the super phylum Lofo forata, but we're looking at the second phylum, uh, Brachiopoda, or Brachiopods. So, as we've learned in the previous lecture, the super phylum Lofo forata. Uh, well, the organisms are characterized by uh, possessing bilateral symmetry. We have a well-developed head and tail region. Uh, there's a one-way digestive tract with mouth and anus. And all of them shared the characteristic of possessing a ring of ciliated hollow tentacles used for filter feeding and respiration that we call the lophophores. And we've looked at the first phylum, the bryozoans, the moss like colonial animals, which have a calcareous skeleton. Uh, now we'll look, look at uh, phylum Brachiopoda. These are lophophorates with paired valves. Valves means shells, a chancra, right? And so they have two shells. So superficially, they resemble um, oysters and clams or bivalves, but these are very different animals, more closely related to the bryzoans, right? more like worms, right? like the foreign worms. Okay, so let's look at the basic body plan, body plan for brachiopods. Um, brachiopods have two shells or valves. That's one here. That's another one. And the soft tissue, the flesh is in, inside it, in the middle. Uh, you also have a soft tissue going backwards uh, out of the shell at the posterior direction. This is the pedicle, and the pedicle is used to attach the animal to a substrate. So there's a, going to be a sea surface, a rock surface. So the pedicle is used as an organ for attachment. Brachiopods possess paired hard shells, so two valves here. Superficially, they resemble the bivalves, but they are different uh, in the soft, soft uh, tissue, of course, and also in the plane of symmetry uh, of, of the valves. Okay, so this is looking at the valve of a brachiopod from the top. So it's a dorsal view, right? So if you look at it from above, that's a single shell, a single valve. The left and right hand side of the shell or valve are the same. So the plane of symmetry is in the middle of the valve. So that is characteristic of brachiopods. If you look at a, a bivalve, which is a mollusk, let's see a cockle shell, uh, crack, right? So if, if you look at it from above, the shell of a, of a cockle, um, you notice that it's not really exactly symmetrical. It's maybe goes uh, towards the right or the left, one thing. But if you look at uh, the two valves of the cockle, you notice that they are roughly of the same shape. That is because the plane of symmetry is between the valves rather than in the middle of the valve. Okay? So that's the main thing. Shells of brachiopods show bilateral symmetry. So there's, there's just a cross-section of a brachiopod just to show you the internal organs. So you notice here that is the lophophore, used for filter feeding and also for respiration. And you have the organs at the back here, with muscles and the digestive system and so on. Okay. Uh, in terms of life habit, um, all the brachiopods are marine, uh, benthic organisms. Uh, they are solitary, not colonial like the bryozoans. And they are filter feeders. So that's a modern day brachiopod. Uh, the two valves here, it is a, a mouth is a gape, you can actually see the local for inside. It's for filter feeders. Okay, so the individual valves of brachiopod display bilateral symmetry. There's a left and a right hand side to your valve, and they are the same in shape and size. Okay. But if you turn the, the organism on its side, it is pandangan CC, the side view or lateral view. Now you can see both valves. You have one larger valve and a smaller valve, and they have different shapes. 
So the two valves are not equal. They are unequal valves. That's another characteristic that can use to differentiate between brachiopods and bivalves. Because if it, this was a bivalve, let's say a cockle shell, both valves will be the same size. Okay. So in brachiopods, you have two unequal valves. Um, each valve has bilateral symmetry, and you have names to them. First, you have the brachial valve. So this is a brachial valve. It tends to be smaller. This was brachial valve. And if you look at, at the interior surface of the brachial valve, flip it over, this is what you get. You get the calcareous skeleton called the brachidium. It's an arch-like structure and it supports the lophophore in life. So there was a lophophore, lophophore here, the tentacles are coming up from here, but now it, the animal is dead, so the tough tissue, the soft tissue has decayed, right? So this is the brachial valve. It has a brachidium to support lo the lophophore for filter feeding. Then you have the larger valve, side here, this is the pedicle valve. We call it the pedicle valve because the pedicle opening is associated with this valve. All right. So turn it again. You get it from above. Uh, take away the brachial valve here. This is what you get. You notice this hole here, right? So that is the pedicle opening. That's the hole where the pedicle, the soft tissue, comes out. Okay. That's a pedicle. And it is used as an anchor to attach to hard substrate. Okay. So that's the pedicle valve. There's a posterior opening for the pedicle, which is a tough organic thread to grow out and attach to the sea bottom. Now, uh, if you read the literature, you notice that uh, some people call the brachial valve the dorsal valve, the pedicle valve the ventral valve. Okay, so it means that this is the top, this is the bottom. Uh, yeah, so this is going to be the, uh, yeah, the larger one is the ventral and this one is the dorsal valve. But notice the life habit of this particular brachiopod. See, the brachial valve is actually at the bottom in this case because, yeah, it's, it's overturned, right? And the pedicle valve is facing upwards, right? So, but still people use, stick to this term, okay? The brachial valve re represents the dorsal. The pedicle valve represents the ventral. So we just need to be consistent. So there is no confusion between paleontologists, right? So we have a common language. Okay. Okay, so you have uh, two valves in an individual brachiopod, and both have different shapes and sizes, so two unequal valves. Okay. Uh, now, the, sh the shape, um, can, there, there's much variation in the shape of the uh, valves of the brachiopod. Sometimes you have this kind of shape. This is called biconvex, where the two valves bulge outwards. That is by convex. The militum is dui chembong, right? Sometimes you have one valve which is convex, goes convex outwards, but the other one is flat. So it's, this one is planar. So you say it is plano convex. Sometimes you have one pedicle valve which is convex outwards, bulges outwards, but the other one is sinking into the shell. Okay? It's, actually, it's actually concave outwards in this side. So we call it concave convex. It's so concave that you can't even see the valve anymore. It sinks into the larger pedicle valve in this, in this case. So that's concave convex. So take note of these, these terms and try to um, identify the different shapes of valves in the brachiopod specimens. So we move on to taxonomy. So we have um, phylum Brachiopoda. These are paired valve, valve animals with uh, lophophores, and you can divide them into two classes. One, which is class inarticulata, and then you have the class articulata. So the articulate and the inarticulate brachiopods. Okay. So we're not talking about brachiopods who are not that good at speaking or anything. It's not, not that kind of articulation. Eh? We're talking about how the two valves are connected to each other, how they are articulated. So let's look at the first class, class inarticulata. 
So, uh, just looking at one order in this class, or the Lingulida. So, age range, Cambrian to Reset. So, it's a long ranging group, and uh, type, uh, yeah, examples of this order are still around today. You can still find Lingula along the west coast of Peninsula Malaysia associated with tidal flats. Okay, so let's look at the characteristics. Uh, so you have the two valves, but the two valves do not articulate with teeth and sockets. Okay? There are no hinges, like a door hinge, right, between the two valves. Yeah? They are, they, the two valves are stuck together only by soft tissue, by muscle. Okay? So you can see the muscles here. If you open uh, the animal here, you see the loss of all here, right? But there are no hinges. So that's uh, uh, one important characteristic of the or of the class in articulata. Uh, also, the valves of class in articulata they are made up of calcium phosphate and the protein chitin. Right? So they have a chitinophosphatic shell. So this is important because the articulate vertebrates more very have calcareous shells, you know, calcium carbonate, calcite. Okay? So that's very different compared to this one. This is chitinophosphatic. This is a chitinophosphatic shell. One of the rare examples of an invertebrate with a chitinophosphatic shell. In terms of life habit, like all um, brachiopods, they're marine, they're benthi organisms, uh, the benthi organisms, and they're solitary. So just ex one example here, the genus Lingula, which is still around today. And uh, they tend, they typically have an O-shaped, elongated O-shaped valve. And the pedicle, pedicle at the back is very large because uh, and it doesn't have doesn't have a pedicle opening. Just goes through in the middle in the two valves. Okay, so let's look at the second class, which is class. This is class articulata. In class articulata, you have the valves articulating with teeth now. Okay. So I have this brachiopod here. I've pried it open. So you have the pedicle valve and then the brachial valve. And just looking at the interior side, okay? Not the exterior. So this is the point of connection between the two valves. On the pedicle valve here, you notice these protrusions here. These are the teeth, gigidia. And the teeth fit into these sockets on the brachial valve, and they are attached there, all right, along the hinge axis, axial. So it's like the hinge of a door. So you have teeth, you have socket, and they connect with each other. They fit in perfectly with each other, right? So that is the characteristic of the class articulata. The class, the, the valves articulate with teeth and socket. So class articulata can be divided into two uh, general groups, right? So just uh, here we just leave it as different groups here. Uh, there's some uh, there's some discussion today regarding the taxonomy. Actually, these are not natural groups, okay? Strophic and non-strophic. Uh, there's a mixture of different lineages between them. And, but uh, if you go through the digital atlas, um, you notice that the taxonomy is slightly different. There's Rinko, Nelata and uh, strophomonata and so on, right? And that is because it is based on lineage rather than the shape of the hinge here. But here we make it simple. You can learn that in second year paleontology. We just make uh, groups very uh, very simple to identify here. We just divide it into two groups. Call it the strophic group and the non-strophic group. How do you differentiate between the two? Well, strophic brachiopods have a hinge line. This line of attachment between the two uh, valves where you have teeth and sockets, right? Which is straight. So that is a strophic brachiopod, straight inch line there, marked by red. Okay. So this is a this is this is a ventral view. Then you have the non-strophic brachiopod, where the hinge line is curving rather than straight. Okay, marked by red here. So it's a brachial valve versus a pedicle valve. Okay. So strophic straight. Non-strophic curve. Strophic group 
can be divided into uh, we recognize here three three orders because you have orders Piriferida, then you have the Strophomenida, and then you have the Orchids. So most of the time we just to shorten it, this discussion we call it the Spiriferous, the Strophomenids, and the Orchids. All right. Let's look at them one by one. Spiriferida. Um, on the Spiriferida, the age range is from Ordovician to Jurassic. How do you identify them? Well, the main characteristic is they have a brachidium which has a spiral shape. Okay? So that gives it its name, Spiriferida. You have a spiral shaped brachidium. Now, the problem with using spiral shaped brachidium to identify is that uh, it requires perfect preservation of the, of the organism, right? Need to have a nice, perfect, unaltered specimen, and then you need to break the shell open to see inside. Now imagine if you have only a fossil cast preserved, you won't get the uh, brachidium preserved. So it's going to be hard to identify spiriferous based on that, based on that uh, character. But luckily, we can use other kinds of features to identify it. First. Spiriferous tend to have biconvex shells. So that's one valve here and the other one. So it's biconvex. They're wider than long. They tend to form like wing shaped towards the side here, right? They have a distinct median fold and sulcus. The structure in the middle here with an upturned lift, uh, upturned lip, lip. Okay, sorry. So that's the sulcus, the depression here, and on the side is protruding out. So that's the fold. There's an upturned lip in the middle. So that's the line here. It's like a mouth, right? Okay. And we tend to have distinct radial ribs. These are these uh, ornamentation on the surface. These corrugations here. And they radiate out from a point. So they are radial ribs. Okay. So now these lines are not radial ribs. They go in the different orientation. These are your growth lines, right? Okay. As the animal grows, you, you form one more line and one more line. adds more and more lines. Uh, life habits still the same, marine benthic feeder. Next order, and, and the, the strophic brachiopods, um, order strophomenida, age range is Ordovician to Jurassic. Now, the strophomenids tend to have plano convex or concavo convex valves. In this, like this example here, you look at uh, a strophomenid from the side, this is lateral view, and you can see the ventral or pedicle valve. But you can't really see the brachial valve because it is concave. So it's behind it, sinking into the ventral valve. So imagine the space for living for the animal is very narrow in this middle, this area here, right? Okay, so that, that's the character. Tango convex to concave convex valves for prophomonids. Uh, the radio ribs are fine, so not as pronounced as that for the spiriferous. And we tend not to have a pedicle. Uh, so there's, uh, there's a limited or closed pedicle opening. You can't really see the pedicle. There's no opening for the pedicle. So why ask? Uh, so how does it attach to the seafloor if it doesn't have a pedicle? So it, uh, these are free living organisms. These were free living organisms. Now, for one group of uh, strophominids, the productives here, we tend to have these long spines growing out from the pedicle valve. So these were used as a support anchor, which is it penetrated into soft mud. So it was used as an anchor. So the animal stayed flat on the seafloor. Okay. So uh, life habits still the same. Marine benthic filter feeder. Okay. These are better views of the product, productive tracking pods, right? Very convex pedicle valves and lots of spines on them. Next group, order Orchida. This is also an ancient lineage, uh, ranging, ranging from the Cambrian to the Permian. Again, it is a strophic brachiopod with a straight hinge line. They tend to be very small. Okay. Uh, we have a biconvex valve. We have biconvex valves. We have a fold and sulcus, so it's very subtle in the, in, in the front here. Okay. Not as distinct as that of the spiritus. And if you, if you are lucky to have well-preserved shells, you can actually see the, the insides. We don't have a brachidium. This is, this is an ancient lineage. 
life habit still the same. Okay, marine, benthic, still the So before we go to the next group, just show you some examples, uh, examples from Malaysia. You don't need to go far away to look at fossil specimens, right? So these are two brachiopods. These are strophic brachiopods with straight hinge lines. This was a nicely preserved hinge line here, right? Even not so much. It's broken at the at the back here. And these were collected from these were collected from Utan I from Kampung Gua Jinte and Utan I in Perlis. Let me try to explain this in Malaysia. From rocks which are of different age. So we know that the rocks uh, uh, probably because they were deposited in a shallow marine environment because you have marine organisms like black reports there. Okay, so these are strophominates, the nice spines. Here. Most most probably this is a productive spines at the at the base of the shell. These are spines uh, along the hinge line. Now, this is a connected black report. Now, both are strophominates. Uh, the picture is very large, right? but these are actually very small organisms, uh, less than two centimeters uh, across. Okay, we will go to the next group, the non-strophic vegetables, where the hinge line is curved. You can, you can subdivide it into three orders here, or the Terebratulida, or the Rinconelida, and or the Pentamerida, also known as the Terebratulids. The rinconelids and the pentamerids. So first, order Terebratulida, age range Devonian to recent. That's long ranging, right? Uh, still around today. Uh, the co most common type of brachiopod known to people uh, uh, familiar with the marine marine environment of modern day. These are characteristics. They have. They have. They, have, they are biconvex. So this is from side view, see? They are biconvex. This is outwards from both sides here. And if you look at it from above or below, from ventral view or dorsal view, notice that the shape looks like a teardrop. This is upside down, but it looks like a teardrop. Okay. The shell tends to be smooth, lacks any distinct ornamentation. You have a fold and sulcus present. So look at it from, a, from the front anterior view. Notice the fold and sulcus in the middle here, right? Now if you slip it and look at it from a dorsal view, and you notice that you can see the pedicle opening. It is round and it is very large. Okay. So that's another characteristic of a pedopatulate. Uh, again, life habit is marine, benthic, filter feeder, solitary. Next group, or the Rinconelida. Still around today also, or the recent to recent. Hinge line, which is curving. Uh, Rinconelids are also biconvex, but it's not a tear shaped drop, a uh, tear shaped uh, shell. From above or below, it is actually triangular. Oh, yeah, tears again. Uh, ornamentation is very distinct. You get these angular radial ribs. Okay. And because of the angular radial, uh, radial ribs, the commissure, which is the border between the pedicle and brachial valve, looks like a mouth, right? Has this zigzag pattern. It's like a jaw with sharp teeth. Okay. And that is very characteristic of the ring Okay, uh, Zigzag anterior commissure, which is the line separating the valves, a very distinct fold and sulcus, a sharp umbo at the back. The umbo is the is, is the back part, it's a big shape. Right? And the pedicle opening is small. We look at the light a uh, real specimen here. Ventral view, triangular shape, right? Angular radial ribs. From a dorsal view, now you can see the pedicle opening at the back here, a sharp umbo at the back. A big shape, zigzag pattern to the commissure from an, in, in an anterior view with a distinct fold and sulcus. Right? Marine, benthic, to the video, solitary. Flashback. Okay, the final group, still non-strophic. You have a curving 
uh, hinge area here, right? Hinge line. Right? So pentamerids range in age from the Cambrian to the Devonian. They are relatively large compared to other types of brachiopods, and they have thick, heavy shells. Okay? They are strongly biconvex. They have a recurved umbo, the beak turns into itself there, right? See? So it hides the pedicle opening. And if you crack open one of the shells, you'll notice that the inside is divided into several rooms, five rooms actually. And it gives the name Penta Merida, okay? Penta, five, right? And it is separated by walls, okay? So most of the time, if you have an internal mold, you can actually see the, the middle wall being preserved here. So this is an internal mold. So the actual shell is dissolved. You just find an impression of the inside, right? So this is the wall that is called the median septum, separating the middle part here. It's, it's in the middle of the shell. Okay. So very characteristic of the pentamerite. You have a median septum and lots of compartmentalization inside it. Uh, like I made the same marine benthic filter media. All right, so those are the groups of uh, the, the main types of brachiopods. Um, the main thing is this: you need to be able to differentiate between strophic and non-strophic brachiopods and the different orders. So you don't really need to uh, memorize the generalized species, okay, for for, 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 for this class, right? Uh, you, uh, one thing to remember. Uh, regarding brachiopod classification. Okay, so I show you here examples which where the classification is actually artificial, it's man-made, right? Like, like let's say the division between strophic and non-strophic brachiopods. It doesn't tell you something about the evolution, the ancestry or lineage, right? Uh, some members of strophic group are actually closely related to non-strophic groups and so on, and vice versa. Right? So just be careful. Uh, it's just that it's hard to it's hard to study taxonomy in ancient organisms. We are just left with the shell, right? You cannot really see the soft tissue, and the soft tissue actually gives the clue in terms of lineage. You can see DNA uh, and so on, right? Um, we're just left with that. And in most cases, the shell is not even that well preserved. You just get a a cast, so you don't really see the the internal structures and so on. So there's going to be disagreement with different people looking looking at the same fossils in different ways, but that's okay. Then. Um, we progress better with more data, we get better better pieces of fossils, or we get more information regarding the uh, DNA and so on. We combine them together with all with other biomolecules. Then. So that is science, it grows. Sometimes we get it wrong, sometimes we get it right. But hopefully you get most of it right. Huh? And later on, future workers can get, get a more accurate uh, understanding of um, how the different organisms relate to each other. Okay, that's it for this week.